Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the ninth evening of our Car Universale lecture series on the question of solidarity, concepts, controversies, perspectives. My name is Kerstin Schmidt. I'm professor of American studies at the Catholic University of Eichstätt Ingolstadt. And together with my colleague from sociology, Joost van Loon, I'm responsible for this series. For those of you who are new tonight, the Cal Universale lecture series takes place every fall term, always with a different topic. It is actually directed at students from various disciplines and will bring them together but it is also open to the public in an effort to reach out of the ivory tower and to connect. While most lectures will be in German, tonight's talk along with four others during the term will be in English and in German. It's an experiment, if you will, in multilingualism. We started the lecture series uh, on November 9th with an official kickoff event with Wolfgang Benz, longtime director of the Center for Research on Antisemitism at the Technical University Berlin. He talked about solidarity, mostly the lack thereof, during the Reichskristallnacht on November 9th. Then our guest was Klaus Dörre from the University of Jena. He talked about what he calls exclusive solidarity in the labor movement and labor unions. Nicole Schneider of our own American Studies Department analyzed forms of visual protest with regard to the movement for Black Lives. Frank Adler from the University of Hamburg sketched ways to practice solidarity with non-human life. And Amin Nasehi of Munich's LMU talked about the nature of protest. My colleague Jörg Althammer talked about the market and solidarity. And just before Christmas, Chandra Talpade Mohanty from Syracuse University in the US spoke about anti-racist struggles and insurgent feminist practice in border situations around the globe. Last week, Giovanna Corvi from the University of Trento in Italy spoke about literature and practices of nonviolence. All talks are still available on KU's YouTube channel. This is perhaps among the very few benefits that virtual life under the dictate of the virus has in store. Tonight's talk will be about crisis. And crisis seems to have been the dominant mode of all our lives since last March. However, this is a very glib, purposefully glib assertion of mine, suggesting a homogeneity of the experience of crisis and a certain newness, at least by degrees, to it all. Rumor has it, crisis is neither new nor shared equally. And the call to solidarity, a clarion call these days, runs the danger of being little more than a feel-good fig leaf easily proposed by those in privilege. Or how come we are preoccupied with sharing the vaccine here for us and the Western world, while there is terribly little news coverage on how the other worlds that our world consists of are considered in this lopsided sharing practice? In any case, solidarity shows itself once more as an urgent, really pressing need, but also as a complex and difficult idea to realize and put in practice. Since we are all in education and we train future teachers, it is all the more important to draw attention, to provide knowledge, to foster a critical and dedicated discussion. The times are trying and demand both kindness and courage to large and maybe extraordinary degrees. In order to do the job of educating us further, of making us learn, we invite people over to talk about usually their research or their practices of the promising, but also difficult topic of solidarity from a variety of perspectives. Now, it is my particular pleasure to introduce to you tonight's guest. And tonight is a true blue exception to a series of scholars. We have invited a writer. We have invited Sharon Dodua Otu, Schriftstellerin, Publizistin und Aktivistin, in London aufgewachsen, hat am Royal Holloway College Management und Deutsch studiert und seit 2006, glaube ich, lebt sie in Berlin. Sharon ist aktiv in Phoenix e.V. und in der Initiative Schwarze Menschen in Deutschland, in deren Vorstand war sie von 2010 bis 2013. Sie veröffentlicht eine Reihe von Artikeln und Kommentaren, unter anderem in Nissi Magazine, Anschläge, AK-Analyse und Kritik, im Tagesspiegel, im African Courier 
und ihre Beiträge, Kommentare, Berichte, Rezensionen, Feuilletons, Diskussionsbeiträge beschäftigen sich mit politischen Fragen des Feminismus, des Weißseins, mit Bildungs- und Kulturthemen. Ihre erste Novel, äh Novelle, The Things I Am Thinking While Smiling Politely, erschien 2012 und 2013 in der deutschsprachigen Übersetzung. Und die heißt Die Dinge, die ich denke, während ich höflich lächle. Und wenn Sie hinter mir aufs Regal gucken, sehen Sie auch beide äh, Bücher direkt nebeneinander stehen. Die zweite Novelle Synchronicity gibt es auch auf Deutsch und Englisch, sehen Sie auch hinter mir auf der anderen Seite. Und das ist vielleicht auch ein Grund, weswegen wir uns mit einem, mit einem bilingualen oder einem multilingualen Abend probieren wollten. Dann gibt es eine ganze Reihe von Kurzgeschichten. Die letzte, die zumindest ich gelesen habe, ist 2019 erschienen und sie heißt Liebe. Die Kurzgeschichte ist in dem von Fatma Edemir und Hengame Yagobi Farah erschienenen Buch Eure Heimat ist unser Albtraum erschienen und das Buch kam in Berlin, in Berlin heraus bei Ulstein 5. Es gibt auch eine ganze Reihe von politischen Artikeln von Sharon, zum Beispiel Correct me if I'm politically wrong, echte Kunst, Elitarismus und weiße Wahnvorstellungen der Erhabenheit. Oder wer hat die Definitionsmacht? Durch die Wahl unserer Worte verändern wir die Realität. Der Artikel ist in dem Buch Critical Whiteness, Debatte um antirassistische Politik und nicht diskriminierende Sprache erschienen. Oder es gibt vom Schauen und Sehen, schwarze Literatur und Theorieproduktion als Chance. Oder es gibt Beiträge bei Old Resort. Sharon ist Herausgeberin der englischsprachigen Buchreihe Witness, auch in der Edition Assemblage. 2016 hat sie bei den 40. Tagen der deutschsprachigen Literatur in Klagenfurt gelesen. Und zwar ihren Text, Herr Gröttrup setzt sich hin. Und sie erhielt den Ingeborg-Bachmann-Preis. Die Hauptfiguren des Textes sind angelehnt an den Ingenieur und Raketentechniker Helmut Gröttrup, dessen Frau Irmgard und ein Ei spielt eine Rolle, die nicht zu unterschätzen ist. 2020 hielt sie die Eröffnungsrede zum Bachmann-Preis. Der Titel der Rede lautet Dürfen schwarze Blumen malen und thematisiert die Bedingungen des schriftstellerischen Arbeitens für schwarze AutorInnen in der deutschsprachigen Literaturlandschaft. Und in ein bisschen mehr als einem Monat, am 24. Februar 2021, also wirklich fast ums Eck, erscheint im S. Fischer Verlag Adas Raum, ihr erster Roman. Current pandemic safety measures prescribe that we cannot have an audience or meet in person. But as always, there's a chance to submit questions during or directly after the talk via KU's Facebook channel or via Vimeo for students. Questions will be forwarded to me. I'll ask them for you, at least as many as possible, after the talk and the conversation between the two of us. Sharon's title tonight is For Those Who Have Been in Crisis. I'm very much looking forward to your talk, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much. What a generous introduction. <laughs> Thank you. I'm really pleased to be here this evening. Um, Yeah, I'll just begin. In preparation for this lecture, I watched the recording of the talk, Black Lives Matter and the Images of Protest, which was held as part of the lecture series in November last year. I was interested to see which connections the speaker, Nicole Schneider, would make between art and activism, as well as to see how she handled the question of her own political identity in relationship to the subject. Those were the scholarly reasons. The other, the other reason I checked out her talk was because as far as I can tell, she is the only other participant in this series who does not hold a professorship. And then I discovered that she has just completed her doctoral thesis. So if there was not already a very good dictionary definition of the term imposter syndrome, I would offer a screenshot of this moment Uh, to the good people at Duden, but I digress. 
While Nicole Schneider spoke from a different position about a different field in a different national context, I do think our talks are in dialogue with each other. In my lecture, I will also consider the connections between art and activism, but instead of photography and visual images, my focus is on creative writing and literary images. I will also reflect on identity, but whereas Nicole Schneider positioned herself as a white academic who researches black protest in the United States, I speak as a black writer activist directly involved in black protest here in Germany. I'll begin, however, by focusing on solidarity. While considering the invitation to speak here and planning my comments for this evening, I thought a lot about the word and how it's used. It seems to me that solidarity is often conceived of as something we perform or we should perform for the benefit of others. So for example, white people engaged in anti-racist activities do or should have the benefit of black people, indigenous people and other people of color as their priority. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I do believe that it's insufficient. Already in the 1970s, a group of Aboriginal rights activists from Queensland, Australia stated, if you've come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you've come here because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let's work together. The quote is often attributed to Lilla Watson, a member of the group, but she insists that it is the principle, sorry, she insists that the principle was formulated collectively. In any case, this idea of joint liberation makes a lot of sense to me. Just last week, I read an article about Taiwan's exemplary handling of the COVID-19 crisis. In it, the nation's digital minister, Audrey Tang, attributes Taiwan's success to the strategy of appealing to the rational self-interest of its citizens. According to Tang, if you say wear a mask to protect the elderly, and then people who do not live with the elderly or do not care about them will not wear a mask. Whereas if you say wear a mask to protect yourself from your own unwashed hands, well then that affects everyone. I believe solidarity is a concept which needs to take more seriously the fact that some individuals are unspeakably selfish, if not many, if not most. And full disclosure, I definitely include myself in that statement. You know how in the events of a flight emergency, you're supposed to put on your own oxygen mask first? Well, as my children will tell you, I'm a big advocate of the aeroplane principle for all other aspects of parenting also. As a single parent, I know that the only way my family can do well is if I'm doing well. <clears throat> Another aspect of solidarity that I would like to think about is how it ties in with privilege and marginalization. Nicole Schneider ends her talk with the example of two non-Black people who met at a demonstration commemorating the 50th anniversary of the civil rights marches in Selma, Alabama. One carried a backpack full of water, one carried umbrellas. Both had understood that their role would not be to take the lead or to center themselves in any way, but to provide black protesters with refreshments and shelter from the sun. She calls this supportive solidarity. I considered what this could mean for my talk. Unlike Nicole Schneider herself and the two people she mentions in the scenario above, I am speaking from within a black movement. So my concept of anti-racist solidarity is tied very closely to that aeroplane seatbelt self-interest thing that I just mentioned. However, even within black movements, there are varying levels of privilege and marginalization. And these can be measured across class, religion, gender, disability status, refugee status, age and or sexuality, to name just a few aspects chosen at random. And within black communities, there are also real challenges around colorism, around social proximity to whiteness, and as well as something that I'll call anti-Africanness. So by way of example, media attention tends to be afforded to those members of the black community who are light-skinned, who have at least one white parent, and or who sound or appear non-African. 
non-African. Therefore, even within black movements, there are questions of positionality. Who speaks and who is therefore sidelined? And how do these decisions reproduce and manifest structural forms of racism at an individual level? I made a joke at the beginning of this talk with respect to the fact that I, a non-academic, have been invited to speak within this lecture series, but behind this light-hearted comment is a more serious point. <clears throat> as far as I can tell, I'm the only black person invited to speak here. And I'm well aware that there are countless conferences and panels in German speaking countries that take place with no black participants at all. So yes, I guess this is progress. However, I am personally aware of two black professors in Germany who would have been more than qualified to speak on the subject of solidarity. Professor Dr. Maisha Uma of the Hochschule Magdeburg Stendhal and Professor Dr. Louis-Anne Riesekwa of the University of Hamburg. Today I ask myself, and I ask us all, how does my presence here in this context reinforce certain extremely damaging stereotypes about black people of African descent in German academia? And please bear in mind the aeroplane seatbelt scenario. I'm not saying do not invite Sharon Dodo Otu, but I am saying invite Professor Dr. Maisha Uma and Professor Dr. Louis Henri Sonkwa also. The question of positionality is one for us all and must ne be negotiated repeatedly as groups of marginalized people are not static homogene homogenous entities, but more akin to fragile solidarity alliances. Our strength comes not from the absence of conflict, but from our ability to negotiate it. And I'm utterly convinced of this fact. It is in my own self-interest to stand in solidarity with individuals and groups who are marginalized in ways in which I am privileged. Why? Because injustice is ambitious. Almost a year ago, in March 2020, Following the news of the outbreak of a global pandemic, Germany went into national lockdown for the first time. The severe restrictions on public life introduced by the government due to the outbreak of COVID-19 overwhelmed almost everybody. <clears throat> Many individuals had up until that point not experienced any existential limits to their freedom of movement, civil rights or bodily autonomy. Unlike those individuals who, for example, have known how it is to be restricted by the so-called Residenzpflicht, this is a law that is unique to Germany, has its origins in colonial times, and forbids applicants for ref refugee status or those who have been given a temporary stay of deportation to move beyond certain geographic boundaries, not even for a temporary visit, not even for a day trip, even medical appointments or meetings with legal representatives require a permit. Suddenly, privileged people were also confronted with severely restricted access to their healthcare, childcare, public transport, social networks, and family support. Suddenly, they were losing their paid work or struggling to juggle home office with homeschooling. Suddenly, they were in new territory, desperately wondering how they would survive. Many parents, particularly young mothers in heterosexual relationships, shared their stories under the hashtag Corona Eltern, Corona Parents. For me, one of the most interesting parts about the stories they shared was how similar they were to experiences I also made during my time as a single parent of three preschool and school-aged children. More awareness and more solidarity from other parents at that time might have led to policy changes then, which would have benefited all parents now. Um, more generous sick leave provision, unconditional basic income, consultation on childcare needs, the possibility of digital schooling, and policy initiatives which penalize men for not taking parental leave. In cisgender heterosexual relationships, women typically take on the bulk of childcare and household responsibilities, a fact which has a significant impact on their so called work life balance their professional options and their career trajectories. If this had been a priority cause of concern before the pandemic, the political response to the situation for parents during the lockdown may have looked very different. 
And there are, of course, other more life-threatening examples. If we as a society truly values Jewish life in Germany, the response of non-Jewish Germans to the gun attack on the synagogue in Halle in 2019 would not be limited to simply hiring more police officers. Or if the lessons of the genocides in Nazi Germany had truly been learned, the Deutsche Bahn would not even have considered dismantling a monument to honor the Sinti and Roma murder victims in order to make way for the extension of an urban railway line in Berlin, as came to light last year. If public health was of serious concern to the federal government, mass accommodation centers for people seeking asylum, like the one in Lindenstrasse in Bremen, where at least 200 of its inhabitants became infected with COVID-19 last year, would have been closed right at, the, uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic. The crisis in democracy is real, ongoing, and people at the brunt end of it have been warning everyone else for decades. This is where I write. As a writer, I feel powerless to protect synagogues and I cannot single-handedly abolish inhumane refugee camps, but I can bear witness I can use my literature in the service of black lives. And I've been asked why I do this, and I've been warned not to do this. But as the multiple award-winning Nigerian novelist Chinua Achebe once said, those who tell you do not put too much politics in your art are not being honest. If you look very carefully, you will see that they are the same people who are quite happy with the situation as it is. And what they're actually saying is, don't upset the system. For marginalized people, the system desperately needs to be upset. For those who have been in crisis, writers can transform our collective pain, reimagine our humanity, and hand it back to us as art. This is why I write. Writing for me is a community endeavor. I write creative fiction in order to depict black lives in a way that does not tokenize re-traumatize, ridicule, or further erase members of my community. I think carefully about my position and make an effort to include black, black, figures, black figures in my writing who are marginalized in ways that I am not. And because my knowledge and my imagination are constrained by the same dominant messages that we are all subject to, I particularly look to share and discuss drafts of my work with people who experience forms of discrimination that privilege me. This is how I write. This evening, I would like to share two examples of my written work. These are extracts from short stories published in a collection called Winter Shorts, edited by my colleague Clementine Burnley and me. The first story, Watching Paint, is inspired by my third son, Lewis, and his experiences in an education system which does not understand dyslexia, a learning disability that affects a person's ability to read, spell, and write. Writing this story was one way for me to show that I was listening and trying to understand. So in the next scene that I'm about to read, Mustafa, an older friend, is persuading Anoche, the main character, to go to school. Anoche is a 12-year-old black British boy who has recently moved to Berlin and does not yet speak fluent German. Mustafa crossed the street one final time that morning, eating the apple as he approached me. Let's go, he said, before taking another bite. Where, I said, to school, forget it. Let's go, Mustafa interrupted me. And that was that. I had not wanted to go, but I didn't really have anything else to do. And even if Mustafa didn't care about me, at least he was bloody good at pretending that he did. Since moving to Berlin, Mustafa was just about the only person I saw outside of school, apart from my mum. As we waited on the platform at Kotbusa Tour, my mood finally got better. Mustafa stared straight ahead and whistled. He was calm and that helped me to feel the same. I was already standing quite close to Mustafa, but I leaned in a little closer and hoped he wouldn't notice. I closed my eyes and breathed in. A mixture of cigarette smoke, coffee, sweat, and cheap aftershave 
filled my nostrils. I stifled a cough. No wonder this guy was still single. Hey, was machst du? I opened my eyes and looked up. Mustafa looked slightly disgusted and pushed me away. How up? I took a couple of steps back and said nothing. Luckily, in that moment, the train arrived. He watched me rarely and made sure that I got on first. There were enough free seats for us to be able to sit down next to each other. The first miracle of the morning. Normally, the U8 is standing room only at 7.50. I fixed my gaze on the view through the dirty, scratched up window. My vision was no longer distracted by the tiny images of the Brandenburg Gate tattooed all over it. As the train left the station, Mustafa asked, why you don't like school? I simply carried on looking at the various shades of black that whizzed before my eyes. I could see absolutely nothing, and that's about how much I felt like saying in answer to such a stupid question. Junge, Schule ist wichtig, Mustafa added. I know he knows, I don't understand, so I just carried on ignoring him. I didn't finish school, he continued. You did know that before? Actually, I didn't, and I didn't care either. I looked at Mustafa and raised an eyebrow. It could have meant so or really, depending on how generous Mustafa's interpretation was. Or did you think I dream all my life of being a carrot seller? Mustafa laughed. His laugh turned into a lengthy smoker's cough, but at least the questions had stopped for now. I sighed and rolled my eyes as I thought about the 20 minute journey ahead of me and about how long Frau Dürnberg would most likely shout at me for being late when I finally did reach school and then how much she would shout at me again a few minutes later for not having done my homework and then again maybe an hour later for not having made any notes throughout her lesson. I thought about how I would probably once again spend the entire lunch break sitting outside Herr Fischer's office watching them, watching me. How I would receive another letter to take home to my mum. Of course, the evening ahead of me would be mostly taken up by her shouting at me for my terrible behaviour this morning, for breaking my new glasses, for me losing my drink bottle and for me bringing home yet another red card from school. No one ever said anything good about me. There was nothing good to say. My life was a collection of disastrous moments knotted together by a desperately thin string of hope that there was some point to it and that I would understand soon. I spoke after Mustafa had finished coughing. I'd rather be a carrot seller than a school kid, Mustafa, trust me. I looked him straight in the eye. School is so boring. It's like watching paint dry. It's killing me. Mustafa sighed but didn't say anything. The train pulled in at the next station, screeching in fact because the brakes needed oiling. All the passengers winced except Mustafa and me. Moritzplatz. I knew it was Moritzplatz because the recorded voice announced it. And because I've traveled this line now so often, I would recognize it even if I was listening to music and couldn't hear the voice at all. Or even if I was listening to music and had my eyes closed, I would be able to feel where we were by counting the number of times the train had stopped. What I definitely would not be able to do would be to read the station's name. And that wasn't because of my cracked lenses. Not the newest glasses, not even a telescope could help me because the letters in the words I read just don't stay still. Moritzplatz could also easily be Mutreutzplatz, Mutreutzplatz, Mitreutzplatz. It makes no difference to me at all. I wiggled my loose tooth with the tip of my tongue. I forgot to say before I started reading that the stories are from this collection. I wanted to hold that up in the camera. Um, the next extract that I'm going to read is from the story, The Romantics and the Criminals. And this story was inspired by several conversations I had with the refugee activist Bino Bianzi Bayakuleka. I met Bino while he was on hunger strike at Oranienplatz in Berlin during the protests which took place there between October 2012 and April 2014. At the time, there were various initiatives to support the refugees. Certainly, many of us wanted to show our solidarity with the movement. 
However, what I learned from Bina was that it made little sense to do for the refugees. It was important to understand that they were experts of their situation, that they understood best what their needs were, and most importantly of all, that their needs were no different from our own. That whatever human rights abuses were meted out onto these people, some of the most vulnerable people of our society, could easily be extended and applied to more increasingly more groups. For example, that residence flicht that I mentioned earlier, well, people who are on state benefits, so-called Hartzfeer, are also required to get special permission before leaving their home area. After visiting a refugee group in 2015, Angela Davis said, the refugee movement is the movement of the 21st century. The Romantics and the Criminals is a short story that I wrote with Bino. And in the following extract, Happy, the main character, is in conversation with two police officers. It is the early hours of the morning at the refugee protest camp. Vera, a white German supporter, is also present. Stand up, Officer Two commanded. There was a menacing tone to his voice. Happy saw two chances, simply comply and have an easy night, or play a bit, but forget about any kind of rest. It wasn't hard to choose. Why, Happy answered, I haven't done anything wrong. Why should I stand? But by now, Vera was heading towards Happy and the two officers. Happy could not be sure that she would stay calm. Stand up, Officer Two repeated. He touched his baton. It was a tiny gesture, but it sent a clear signal, which immediately refreshed Happy's memory of one particularly fierce beating he had taken at a demonstration last month. What's going on? Vera asked. She was breathless and agitated. She turned to Officer Two. Was wollen Sie von ihm? Ich bin die Ansprechpartnerin. It's okay, it's okay, Happy said, slowly, raising, uh, slowly rising to his feet. Here you go, I'm up. He smiled cheekily at Officer One and then gave Officer Two his best poker face expression. Are you the one they call Happy? Officer Two asked, looking him squarely in the eyes. Happy did not blink. He simply responded, I am he. Officer one shifted nervously from one foot to the next. Officer two stood firm. Where are the documents for the registering of this protest? He asked. Happy sniggered, always the same, always the same. He looked around at the 30 something tents, some in better conditions than others. In the moonlight, the place looked calm and peaceful. Oranian Platz had looked like this since the refugees and their supporters had arrived last October. How would it even be possible for this protest to have been going on for so long without the correct documentation? Happy would have loved at this point to have asked the officer for evidence of his permission to ask to see evidence of Happy's permission to protest. There was bound to be a paragraph so so and so about it somewhere. Germans love nothing more than laws and documents. Everything in this country was surely regulated by a stiff looking East German woman sitting behind a desk surrounded by a collection of pens and rubber stamps. Das hatte ich aber gerade schon mit ihren Kollegen durch, snapped Vera. She was cold, exhausted and frustrated. She had changed so much since the beginning of the protest. Happy didn't yet understand enough German to know exactly what she was saying, but he guessed from her tone and her body language that she was telling the officers that the paperwork had already been checked. Ich rede mit dem Asylant hier, started Officer Two. Officer One took a step back. Vera's face flushed bright red. Happy had heard that word, Asylant, before, almost always from Nazis or people who were not too good at disguising their right wing allegiance. Someone in one of the nearby tents coughed. Er ist eine geflüchtete Person, she hissed. Clouds of warm air left her mouth as she spoke. Happy studied her face carefully to try and work out what was now going on. Officer, Officer Two smirked, wie dem auch sei. Hier sind die Papiere, Vera held up a folder. Nun lassen Sie ihn in Ruhe. Happy held the by now cold cup in his left hand and reached out to Vera with his right. He pulled her to one side while the officers carefully studied the folder she had given them. Listen, Vera, he whispered, please, please stick to English when I'm around, okay? 
She nodded, ashamed. He had told her and the others several times that this was a refugee protest, not a good German person charity event. The refugees were to represent themselves at all times. The supporters could translate, but could not simply take over. He wanted to see the registration documents. It's, it's just games. And why did you get angry? Vera looked at the ground and adjusted her hair. As usual, it was tied back in a ponytail. Whenever she got nervous, she would try to make it even tighter. He used this word, azulant. It's a racist word for refugees. She then looked back up again at Happy. Fucking hell. Happy watched the officers poring over the folder, trying to find something that they could complain about. Well, at least this way they're showing who they really are, Vera sighed. Exactly, Happy smirked. They're being honest, not bad. One aspect of this subject, which is difficult to address and I have no real solution for, is the question of remuneration. How ethical is it for artists who claim to stand in solidarity with marginalized communities to profit financially or otherwise from their creative work with or about them? Where, for example, a white photographer captures award-winning images of black people protesting, like in Nicole Schneider's talk, or where a non-refugee author wins prizes for a novel based on the experience of a life, asylum seekers. None of the authors whose work was published in the short story collection that my two stories also appeared in was paid. Winter Shorts is part of a book series that I curate in partnership with the Munster-based publishing collective, Edition Assemblage. The book series is called Witnessed, and provides an English speaking platform for people of African descent who have lived in German speaking countries to commit their experiences and their analysis of those to paper. Five books have appeared in the series so far. The sixth one, a poetry collection by Anya Saleh, is due to appear in April this year. I founded the book series because I wanted to share my access to the publishing industry with other black writers. This was intended as an act of solidarity. However, this book series is entirely unfunded and this is entirely undesirable. Framed as an empowerment activist project for and by black people, I'm able to stomach it, but it is something that needs to change. Since I initiated uh, the Witness series back in 2012, I've become a professional creative writer. This at once presents opportunities, for example, access to a much wider audience, including the opportunity to speak here this evening. But it also presents difficulties, particularly with regard to the financial issue I just mentioned. Can I write in solidarity with black communities while accepting paid reading and lecture engagements based on an expertise that I've gained through my activist training? My interim answer is to do what I've tried to do this evening. Take the money. This is an aeroplane in trouble situation but use my relative safety to hand out face masks to others. Use my influence to highlight the work of my siblings, while at the same time reflecting on my own implications in discriminatory structures and to keep chipping away at them bit by bit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so very much. You touched on so many issues, self-critical issues. <laughs> I have a hard time to, to, um, to pick a topic to, uh, to start from. But since you are a writer and you said, what can I do as a, as a writer? Um, you can't single-handedly change the situation in refugee camps, can't change people around you, but you can write. And I'm, I'm a teacher. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I thought our first topic, natural topic would be language. Yeah. And um, there's almost a culture war on language, on the kind of German, on, on that little asterisk, Autor, Innen. Um, there, yeah, it's about changing language and about the way people react to changes, whether they welcome it, whether they think, of course, it has to do with political correctness, another mm -hmm. hot topic. But since your, um, your talk, 2020 at the Bachmann Prize, 
ähm, dürfen schwarze Blumen malen oder dürfen schwarze Blumen malen. It's, yeah. <laughs> so, and you talked about the issue of the capitalizing um, schwarz or you don't capitalize it and about change in language. Could you elaborate a little bit more on it? I'm aware it's a huge topic, but yeah. as a writer, how do you think about it? How do you change it? And you change a lot, at least from my experience. <laughs> yes. There's a, I mean, it is a really huge topic. It's about how you write, um, yeah, capitalization or asterisks, as you've mentioned. So, so uh, re resignifying vocabulary or reclaiming vocabulary, perhaps. Um, and I think it's about tradition. I think language has a special role, as I understand it, particularly in the German context, language plays a, a very uh, specific role in bringing the nation together, right? Um, I heard somewhere that the word Deutsch, hang on, what was it again? The word Deutsch means, what was it again? Was it people or language or something? There was a, there's this thing where the people of Germany are Germany because they all spoke German, something like this. And um, culture also plays a role in that, of course, that like you share language through culture. So of course, if then people who are perceived to not come from Germany uh, are here and saying, oh, we would like to uh, change up the, the structures a little bit and change up the vocabulary and the spelling and everything. Then of course, the people who um, see the language as theirs, their heritage, um, and it's intertwined with their identity, their national identity, that's going to be painful. And I also think there's a lot of um, nostalgia attached to language, particularly, for example, when the so-called uh, Kinderbuchdebatte broke out, or was that 2012, 2013? Um, it seems to me that there was a lot of emotional attachment to certain books, Pippi Langstrom, Die Kleine Hexe, um, that didn't really have that much to do with the fact that these books were such great works of art uh, and must be protected at all costs, but it was more to do with the fact that these books were intertwined with the memory of childhood, um, possibly with the memory of sitting on a parent's lap and that parent reading it to you or grandparent's lap or what have you. And it seemed to me that that was more what was being defended, that this memory and this very positive memory and how could that be racist as well. There's another aspect to it is the word racism in, um, as far as I understand it, in the German context is extremely loaded. I think it still is extremely loaded. Back then I, I said, I would speak about the fact that racism was very tightly linked with Nazism, very tightly linked with the crimes um, in the Second World War. And then, so if you use the word racism to talk about children's books, people are like, what is going on? How dare you, you know, sacrilege. And if, however, racism is, I used to talk about wanting to reclaim the word racism because I used to think I'd like to use the racism much more in an everyday way, not to insult people, um, not to make people burst out into tears, but just to say, this is how it works. This is how it functions. Racism is a, um, a power structure that privileges uh, some people and marginalizes others on, on this scale. It's white people um, and then people of color and black people on the other side. And so if I say then, yeah, the book Pippi Langstrumpf, which I also loved when I was reading it because I was a big fan of this emancipated young girl who was living alone and living the life, you know, if I talk about that book and say, but it's a racist book, yeah. I'm not trying to insult anybody. I'm not trying to insult Astrid Lindgren particularly. Um, I'm just saying, look at what it does. It reproduces stereotypes and it uses a, a language that's um, degrading and demeaning. And I know that I, I don't want to do that as a writer. Perhaps Astrid Lindgren also wouldn't have wanted to do that if she had known better, if she had had access to the knowledge that I now have access to. And similarly, I think it's entirely possible that I could be re reproducing damaging stereotypes. I hope that people will tell me. I hope I will have the humility to say, I'm very sorry, I didn't want to do that and try better next time. But um, yeah, we need to think about these different positions with the language. Um, I think of language as a compromise. It's um, a means to an end. 
you know, the words that I'm using may or may not be understood by you right now, depending on what, you know, what meaning you attach to them. And it's a negotiation that we have to keep checking in with each other. Did we understand what the other person said? Um, sometimes it's more obvious than others. You know, sometimes we have a, a frame of reference and then we both speak very freely and it's easy. Sometimes we're coming from two completely different standpoints and then it's much harder to understand where the other person is coming from. But I think it shouldn't be taken for granted. I think even, you know, even if the fact that we both speak English, it doesn't mean that we both mean the same thing when we use certain yeah. words. So I think of language as a negotiation and the, you, you know, the suggestion to use um, the gender gap or the asterisk to be more inclusive of people, for example, who um, don't fit into the gender binary. I think this is a, a brilliant option. And it could be at some point in time that that's also seen as not really the right option and we might have to rethink it. And I'm, I'm very open for that. And I, I really hope that we can develop that. Just be open, yeah. The main problem from my perspective is that people tend to believe, maybe for nostalgic reasons, certainly for attachment reasons, that language is something stable. Mm. And language has changed so much. Think of, as I was growing up, you would you would call an unmarried woman a Fräulein. Yes. <laughs> Thank God, that's out of the question. <laughs> um, it's so funny because with the Fräulein, I was thinking, I had, I don't know if it was the same for you, but for me it was always a bit weird, this word. I, and there's another word that I don't like, which is nation. I just, I just think, what is that? And why is it das? Like, how dehumanizing. So I always had this weird feeling with Fräulein, and I was one of the people who was so happy when it was gone. And it could be, I mean, I'm sure there are other women who really were proud of the status of Fräulein, or they wanted to retain it. And yeah, what do you do about that? Who, who would, who would um, insist on being called Fräulein? Yeah. yeah. And also Mädchen, all, like the entire English-speaking world wonders how this can be a new <laughs> it does not make sense to me. This word. <laughs> There's also one particular verb, actually, that I know you 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 wrote about that that verb, and it it has it has bugged me for for a really long time. That is dürfen. Which dürfen? Dürfen. Yeah. It's a very. You say somewhere it's the it's the deutscheste aller Verb. <laughs> and what bugs me, or what what made me or keeps me want to think or change around is that that sentence that you keep hearing, das wird man ja wohl noch sagen dürfen. Um, very tricky and not at all naive and loaded, loaded expression. Yeah. And you hear it almost everywhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Das dürfen and you say it kind of clashes like two concepts clash, Meinungsfreiheit and Konsequenzenfreiheit. Yeah. Could you like, elaborate, since it's your word, it's not mine, I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, okay, for, for the first part, the Dürfen part is fascinating to me. I believe it's true that there is a, this is a very big generalization, very, very big. Please don't nail me on this. But I feel like having lived in both contexts, in the UK, there is more tolerance of rule breaking. You know, people do cross the road, at a, a red light if there are no cars coming. And in Germany, there is more of a kind of a self-policing atmosphere where people are like, oh, these are the rules. And if you break them, there's gonna be someone wagging their finger at you. And within that context, I think, also, yeah, German language has been through Sprachreform, you know? and it's used to trying to get it into a standardized, um, yeah, we have your Duden and the experts and so on. And I think English is more used to people taking the language and running with it. So you've got Australian English, you've got various different West African flavors of English, you've got your US American English, people in Scotland don't necessarily understand what's going on in London and so on. And um, so you've got this country where people are like trying to, trying to find the rules and trying to stick to the rules or, you know, work out how to break them in a way that no one notices, okay. And then um, there's this word, dürfen, das darf man nicht. I used to hear this so much, you know, das darf man nicht. And, das, and then you have this, das wird man ja, na, wo sagen dürfen. And I said to him, I always said to myself, but 
it is allowed. You are allowed to insult people and to be, I mean, you're not allowed to insult people legally, right? But if you use a racist term, the likelihood that you will be um, prosecuted and found guilty of insulting someone is very small. I remember that somebody used, I think it was a politician, used the N word to describe someone or something, I don't know. And there was an attempt made to, to label this as a racist act and that was rejected. And I think it's more likely for me as a black person to be, um, um, charged with insulting, say, a, a, a police officer, if I say he's racist, if he calls me an N-word, nothing much is going to happen. So I'm, I'm fascinated by political correctness and are we not allowed? I think you are allowed to say pretty much when it comes to discrimination, people say all sorts, the wildest things. So many people say to me, yeah, you're not allowed to say the N-word anymore. Journalists said it to me recently. <clears throat> you're not allowed to speak out the word if you do then you lose your job I'm, I'd like to see the day that that happens so the only time I hear the n-word at the moment is when people tell me that they're not allowed to say it highly frustrating so um what was the question again so this Durfin thing so I'm like yeah of course people mandata the, the, the question is why do you want to do it why would you want to actually annoy somebody or offend somebody? What, what's the point? Um, I think by now, 2021, most people know it's a problematic word, for example, using the N-word. So if you use it, why do you want also to have the freedom to dictate what my response to that will be? Uh, that's that like real overreach. And, and I think that um, the problem is that there's been a, a very long period of time where people in black communities have been trying to say there are certain words we don't want to hear. There are certain words that are being used to describe us, names that we are being called. Um, and we're saying we reject those names. We want to replace them with other names that we've chosen ourselves. Um, and there was for too long a, 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 um, an atmosphere of, um, yeah, but, you know, they're not really German or they don't they don't have the competence to decide such things. They don't understand history. They don't understand culture or whatever. And now finally, um, black people are more and more represented in different uh, professional walks of life, including the media. And these perspectives are, are being articulated in much, um, you know, in redaction and I don't know if in newspaper um, teams and it's now no longer taken for granted that these things can just be said. Now you'll probably hear someone who will say, uh, actually, that's not up to date anymore, that language, or that's actually quite insulting, or the R word, that's actually quite racist. Um, and I think that's the problem, that people were used to just speaking freely and not worrying about the consequences of their words and now being confronted with the consequences of their words and finding that uncomfortable. But... Um, yeah, I think this too will pass. <laughs> I think it's a phase we're going through. And then, like Fräulein, we'll just not hear it anymore. Yeah. And people will get used to new things because there is a difference whether you say Lehrerinnen und Lehrer or Lehrerinnen. It yes. sounds different, sound makes different, as you say. Yeah. And maybe that there is so much so much resistance towards this change. I actually, in many ways, I take this as a quote unquote good sign things are changing and as soon as they change there will be resistance which yeah. tells you that things do change which is a good thing but <laughs> I think so too it's, it's it's very tiring it's a lot of work but I think that's how it is yeah and the place where things could change as a hub for change would be school like in theory I'm not saying that this is as a as a person who, who went to German school herself and who also grew up with leading reading Strobelpeter and others. Um, but school could change. And your your short story, Liebe, is about parenting, about your sons and um, and I, I liked what your son or how your son described your um, parenting effort. Mm -hmm. He said you gave him politische Rüstung. But sometimes you would have preferred der, den Segen der Unwissenheit. Mm. Mm. And it's, could you, like, yeah. 
But my you... assumption, yeah, my assumption was when I was raising my children mm -hmm. that they would have similar experiences to me, which I think they did. So similar experiences of feeling alienated in school, um, the overt stuff where you're called names, but also like the subtle stuff where people don't expect much of you or, um, yeah, very shocking images come up in geography books, you know, harmful representations of uh, Africans and, and things like this. So my assumption was that they were going to also experience these things and that it would be useful and helpful for them to know, A, that it was probably going to come and B, um, yeah, my, the idea was that they wouldn't internalize it and think it was something wrong with them, but it was how the system is. Um, and what was really nice was having discussions in the family about these things. And, you know, we also, my family is bilingual, so we'd also be reading different, you know, accessing different comedy shows, for example, and being able to laugh about racism is sometimes very um, healing. And so we would have an atmosphere where we would discuss these things and talk about them and make light of them. What I underestimated was the atmosphere within which we spoke about racism at home was not at all the same by any means as how it was in the school context. Um, I mean, I knew this of course, and I behaved differently in different contexts, but I hadn't really considered that my children hadn't had that experience that I had had. So they were walking into school and kind of probably assuming that everybody else was on the same wavelength, you know, they would understand that this was a, a thing that was problematic. And if you just point it out, then they'll agree and then the conversation will move on. They hadn't had that much experience of um, what I call white fragility uh, and white tears. You know, this, oh my God, she said I'm racist, what am I gonna do? That wasn't really in their uh, sphere of reference. So when in, um, the son who I spoke to for Lieber, when um, he went to school and would say, oh, by the way, you know, that is, that is linked to that, you know, this is the historical context and so on, that completely overwhelmed everybody around him. Um, and so when he says he wishes he'd had the signal of Unwissenheit, um, what do you call that in English? The blissful ignorance, I think it was something. Ignorance of, ignorance of bliss. I can't remember. He said it in English, actually, and I translated it into German. But he was talking about how it might have been if he had just experienced an incident and just thought, yeah, that was weird, <laughs> and then moved on, you know, that that might have spared him countless, very tiring discussions and awkward moments. And actually, he, he ended up having to yeah do his um high middle school qualification in a different school because he just had so many conflicts it, it, it ended up in deadlock um he he was sort of hypothesizing that that might have been better for him but at the same time he also knows that that's not true because he's also experienced uh school friends who did have this um blessing of ignorance or whatever you call it um who were also still very, very hurt by what they were experiencing. And I had that, right? I, I grew up not really understanding what, what was going on, not really understanding why I was making the experiences I was making, but assuming they must be correct. You know, I trusted the adults and I assumed that if they were doing these things, that was for a good reason, that I really was whatever, not as intelligent or something. So I think that that's not the best strategy either, but yeah, we're working on it. What is a good strategy? Yeah. Yeah, and maybe there is not, not much of a choice because ignorance for some people is dangerous, whereas for others it is less less so. Yeah. I thought of, um, I thought of your fellow writer Tanaisi Coates' book, Between the World and Me. Yeah. Son, who says, your body is in a particular danger. And yeah. that is why I need to write to you about um, about the ways in which the body is endangered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah, not that's true. Mm -hmm. Um, there are oh there are already questions from the audience and since I can't occupy all of all of you I will sneak in one or two and then and then try to get my own in as well. <laughs> um, I will well there's a question from the students and um, the topic is 
the student wants to like wants to know about solidarity in relation to concepts like peace, justice, and freedom. The question: Do you think that through the pandemic we will see shifts that will work in favor of society after negotiation, or that the current problems will be amplified and explode our society? Oh, yes. Either or. <laughs> explode. Um, right at the very beginning of, of the lockdown last year, March 2020, I was quite optimistic. I don't know, I had a weird, it was such a weird moment. It was so, I felt like I was living in a Marvel movie. <laughs> like the whole world had shut down and it was so bizarre. And then there were these images of, you know, clean streams, uh, you know, no pollution and such. And I thought, wow, this is a chance. This is a real chance. Um, that when everything gets reset, we can start it in a different mode. And, and I remember thinking there were, there were discussions about solidarity within the German context, for example, that uh, payments were made, one-off payments were made to freelancers. Um, and I thought, oh, this is nice, you know. But I very quickly lost that optimistic feeling because as I spoke about a little bit in my, in my talk, I realized that this, this solidarity didn't extend everywhere. There were homeless people um, somehow being left to figure it out on their own. They're not allowed to sleep on the streets, but where should they sleep? No one could figure that out. And there were empty hotels. And many people were making the call to put the two, <laughs> solve the problem, um, but that didn't happen. Then you had uh, people living in um, refugee accommodation um, way too many, like it was just packed um, and there was no possibility for them to physically distance and they were just left with it. They, were, they had to deal with it themselves. Um, so then I quickly realized, that, okay, the, the, the concept of solidarity doesn't extend to everybody. Um, and then as the situation developed, it looked very much to me like the main priority has been to protect the economy and to protect businesses and how, for example, parents deal with it in their private lives, that's not so, you know, how children deal with it, how young people deal with it, um, they're pretty much left to figure this out on their own. And, and that kind of shocked me a little bit. So then I thought, well, no, it's going, all gonna go back to normal. I'm not sure if it will explode. I think my, my, my guess is, my assumption is that we are all so, under pressure um, and we're under pressure in a way that means we kind of living day to day, you know, trying to figure it out from one moment to the next, how we're going to manage it, that it's very difficult. There's only a few people left, I think, who have the capacity to think outside of the box and to think things through and to say, oh, this could be a vision for change. There's a, there's a group of people who've started a, a zero COVID petition, which I also signed. They're some of the people who've managed somehow un, under these circumstances to, to formulate a vision for how things could be better. My assumption is that because there's so many people just so under pressure, just trying to you know pay their rent and, and put food on the table, that when the COVID crisis is over, they're just gonna be in recovery mode. I don't see a, a revolution or an explosion either, unfortunately. It's not a surge of solidarity, apparently. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking there's also a question about Corona and care. Mm -hmm. You talked about this in, in um, a little while ago, um, that this is a terrible situation and a terrible backlash for all ideas of, um, of the feminist movement. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because care is back um, where some people thought it belonged anyway with the women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, there's not much to say to that. <laughs> it's uh, highly, highly unfortunate. There are isolated examples where I think it does work. And um, there are, um, like I said, heterosexual couples who figure it out and have, have got a very good balance. And I, I'm aware of those and I don't wanna talk down those people. But in general, I think that, um, I mean, the person who nearly became um, the head of the Christian Democratic Union, like his comments about women recently, like yesterday or whenever it was, 
that, that's so shocking. But and again, it's not shocking because that's probably the view of many men of his generation. This kind of yeah assumption that women somehow are the weaker sex and need to be protected and very, 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 very concerning. And I, I wish that um, I wish that the 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 talks, the discussion, the discourse around gender equality had gotten much further than it has. Um, and I, again, because the crisis has hit the way it's hit and individuals are just struggling to survive, I, f I feel pessimistic that the political demands that will be made arising from this will have any effect because people will just be, I just said it again, they'll be in recovery mode, which is a real shame, yeah. And not much talk or not much resource to rethink mm. how it might work. Um, there are lots of questions. Um, the next one um, from Facebook. Um, there are overlapping crises in our current moment. Environmental disasters, refugee crises, a crisis of democracy, a global pandemic. What problems does this pose for the economy of solidarity or our attention span for solidarity? How does this affect the work of activists and their work? couple of questions in one. Yeah, it's great. It's a very good question. And it's the kind of question that I should actually go away and think about. <laughs> <laughs> Write a clever lecture and then come and deliver my answer. But um, I, I don't have a very big answer to it. My initial response is that I think that has to do with this airplane mode that I was talking about. That yes, there, there are big challenges ahead. And if we try as an individual person to consider everything and to try and balance everything out in, within ourselves, we're going to very quickly be overwhelmed. Um, so I would advocate trying to conceive of this as a, um, as a movement, as a, a group of people who are many, many people, many, many different groups working on these different things. And then from your own perspective, figure out what, where do you benefit? Where could you personally benefit from a specific change? And then you will have skin in the game and then you will, you will act because it's out of your own yeah, self-interest. Like that's a very short answer. It's much, it should be a much more involved answer. But basically I think we are all really stretched and really tired. And if we try to behave in this way of, oh, it's for the benefit of someone else, we're going to run out of steam. It's, it's, it's too hard. Um, of course, we shouldn't be trying to actively damage anybody else. But it's important to try to integrate what you're doing uh, within your, yeah, to try to integrate it within your life, within your, your social network, within your uh, professional work, within your friendship circle, um, family, and uh, yeah, so that it's sustainable. That's what I would argue. Mm -hmm. There's, um, since we talked about language and language like German and English and, um, and the switching in between two, a student would like to know, uh, he or she writes, in Germany, there's no word that corresponds to the English race. Doesn't the translation racism, race, have to be thought through again? The word racism has to be thought through. No, the translation race and racism from English to German, because as you said, if you translated mm. race. Um, yeah, it's, it's, that comes back down to what I was saying about language being a consensus. I think this is my answer. It's a bit philosophical. <laughs> I've been reading Nietzsche. <laughs> so, um, it's about this consensus. And there was a consensus not so long ago that the German word for race, Rasse, meant whatever it is, mentioned Rassen, and that this fixed entity, and there are these four groups and so on, Rassen theory. Um, that, of course, uh, that, that has been superseded. There's new knowledge about that. It's scientifically proven that there's no such thing as uh, individual groups of um, human races. Um, and yet this, this concept, the concepts that, of, that, that people are really different and that there are sort of, yeah, homogenous groups of different people um, still exist. And 
um, even I think within the, the US context or the UK context, even though the word race is used um, as a social construct, social political construct, um, I would argue that there is still confusion about that. I, I, I look to the words biracial or mixed race and I, and I look at the way that these words are used and how people speak about, for example, the, a lot of the work, um, a lot of the newspaper articles that came out in the UK around the time of the first, when the COVID crisis first hit, there was an analysis, which we can't do in Germany because we don't do ethnic monitoring in Germany, but in the UK they were saying um, many black people are more hard, more, more seriously hit by COVID than white people. And what they meant was black people are more typically working in frontline services. They're more working, you know, in um, fast food outlets or uh, as cleaners or in hospitals, nurses and such. Um, and so therefore they're more in contact with public facing um, people. And then those people who are able to work from home, able to socially distance, physically distance in their offices or what have you, um, they tend to be higher income and they tend to be white. But if you read the newspaper articles and the comments and the discussions, it always seemed like they were saying, oh, there's a genetic component to it. Black people are more susceptible to COVID because of some kind of genetic thing. Mm -hmm. So there, it was a misunderstanding that had to be constantly, you know, there had to be a constant discussion about it. No, this is not what we mean. And race is a social construct, and it has to do with systems of discrimination, why, why black people are more susceptible to COVID. So in Germany, um, we have this word Rasse, which people avoid using. And then we don't have the translation for the social construct of race in Europe. No, I think the approximation might be Rassifizierung, the racialization. We could perhaps work with that. Um, we have the, I think the question also arises because there's a current discussion around um, the removal of the word race or the replacement of the word race um, in the German constitution with another word. The German word Rasse, so the argument goes, is completely useless um, if we're trying to do um, anti-discrimination work and we need a new word. There are, to be fair, um, there are other voices that say, Mm, the German word race should not be considered to be any different from any other translations of the words in any other language. We should come up with a new social construct, a uh, new social contract on how to use that word. So we should try to talk about race in German language and mean exactly that, that is a social construct. I'm kind of pessimistic that this word can be reclaimed in that way. So I'm one of those people who are happy that there's a discussion going on about the replacement of the word in the, in the German constitution. But I would say, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a negotiation. There isn't, I don't believe there's an instance that's gonna solve this problem once and for all and we're all gonna agree and <laughs> good is. I think we're always gonna have negotiations and discussions. Can you do this? Can you do that? Can you say this? Can you say that? Yeah. And, and, and keep the dialogue going. Keep the dialogue going, yeah. Mm -hmm. You talked about um, the positionality within the black movement, mm -hmm. and I felt reminded of an of an interview with uh, um, Alicia Garza, the Black Lives Matter founder, and she said, since she's not as visible in in the movement as her male predecessors, like Al Sharpton or, or, or Jesse Jackson, and she said, you know, this is precisely what she thinks needs to be done in order to tackle the problems, that you have a different way of organizing the structure of movements themselves, um, that you say you don't have like heroic figures, most yeah. of the people, while the women do the work. Um, yeah. And she was also criticized for that heavily and was criticized for, um, for, for um, including like queer people and not so, not, not so much. Could you, could you elaborate on, on that a little bit on the dynamics of solidarity within the movement? Yeah, um, I don't know um, the, the interview or the paper that you're referring to, but what, what she's saying makes a lot of sense to me. And I have thought about this recently that um, the way that we, um, the way that 
movements have informed the way that uh, anti-discrimination work or empowerment work works um, is very much focused on heroes. <laughs> and you have a figure who has written a brilliant book or given a brilliant talk, or I don't know, he's it, got a great blog, I don't know. And then for a while, this person becomes the guru and everything centers around this person. Have you read it and have you seen it? And, um, that's kind of nice if you're the person. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, but it's, it would be better um, perhaps in the end also for the person to reduce this representation burden. It will be better if that hero status could be spread a little bit. And I'm really fascinated by movements that manage to do that. And it's something that I've been thinking about while I was writing my book actually. Um, Adas Raoma was struggling to do that. I have a figure in my book who is very clearly the main figure. And if you like, she's the heroine. But I kept on struggling with that because I thought it would be really nice to try and depict that she's part of a group of people or part of a family or part of a social movement. And that's not so easy to do. It feels to me like our culture isn't really geared up to, to, to that. We're still very focused on the individual. But um, I am also um, a member of um, the initiative Black People in Germany. I think, although we're, there are individual people who kind of pop up from time to time, one person that, whose name keeps being mentioned, of course, is Maya Yim, one of the founders of the movement, who's also uh, a poet. Um, I think that the, in general, people do speak about the most recent Black German movement, and they mention uh, the ESD. And then there's also the sister organization, um, Adifra, which is a black queer feminist organization. And <clears throat> in the German context, I think that Adifra has that feel for me of a collective that moves as a collective and doesn't have, of course there are people within um, Adifra who are excellent. And um, I've actually mentioned one of them in my talk, Professor Dr. Maisha Uma. But it feels to me that the, 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 the main focus of Adifra is to try to, to, to nurture a collective and, and a lot of its activities are focused on how can this collective be strengthened. Um, and that's, that's what I would like to try to do. So I, I agree with Alicia. I'm sorry that she experienced criticism for that because it seems to me actually the most sustainable way to go and the most honest way to go, yeah. Actually, a wonderful way that it works this way too without that hero, that, that hero figures. Um, yeah. Which is usually alpha alpha male hero figure. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm. and, and the the other issue that I'm also the, struggling with is solidarity, not just within groups but also between different groups. Mm. And I'm thinking about a very like a more of a current event, the way that the uh, the African philosopher historian Ashil Mbembe was 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 treated. And um, the problems between like uh, Jewish solidarity, black solidarity, yeah. you know, different groups. And there are many examples for that, like feminism or womanism. There's, um, yeah. could you talk a little bit about your, your experiences with, with intergroup solidarity or your, your yeah. thoughts on it? Um... So in my talk, I've spoken a bit about diversity within the black community, which is one aspect of this um, solidarity intergroup. Mm -hmm. And then there is what I understood the question immediately was like the black community, which is already mm -hmm. tricky, but anyway, with um, whatever, the Jewish community and how those two groups um, can be in solidarity with each other or not? Is that is that more the question? Yeah. 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 Solidarity between different groups. It doesn't have to be these two. They just no. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's it's not something. I don't think I've. Let me think. I haven't got an example to mind of where I was part in part of um, an organization that pursues that. It's something that I try to think about a lot. I, I mentioned it a little bit in, in my speech, uh, Dürfenschwarz of Blumenmalen, and I'm definitely like, for example, 
um, the book um, Eure Heimat ist unser Altam, the essay band where Lieber was published. I think that was an example of something where different people from different positions came together to produce a common statement. And what I really love about that project is out of, out of it, um, we have often done, with, I think, solidarity uh, readings, a couple of solidarity readings, which raised money for different groups. Um, at the moment, we're currently producing uh, an audio book, and that's also being done as a solidarity project, raising money for different groups. So that's something that I really like. And one <clears throat> project which I'm in awe of, one project which I think is amazing, is um, work done um, I mean, I know of Max Cholek, who kind of is doing it and speaking about it all the time, Tage der Deutsche Jüdisch Muslimische Leitkultur. This is amazing. How would you say that in English? Days of the German Muslim Jewish, what is Leitkultur? <laughs> <laughs> okay, it probably exists actually in English anyway, doesn't it? This word like But I love this project so much because it's explicit. Well, first of all, it takes this word like kultur, which is usually a kind of white German Christian background concept, which claims a kind of uh, dominance and legitimacy. And it says anybody who wants to come to Germany and anybody who wants to be part of the German social culture has to adhere to this concept, the leading culture. Um, and I'm not such a fan of that line of thinking. I'm more in line with Max Cholek and radical diversity. But anyway, I'm coming to Germany. I'm doing my German test. I, you know, I'm going to behave myself. But um, Max has taken this word like Kultur. He's kind of stolen it from them and turned it into his own thing where he's uniting the, the Jewish community, again, this homogenous way there, the Jewish community and the Muslim community saying that we have our own light kultur, we've joined together and we're doing a light kultur of our own. I love it. And um, I think what he's managed to achieve with this art project um, is light years ahead of what the politicians have managed to achieve. The politicians are still kind of grappling with this concept of Heimat and trying to somehow save it from the right wing people and you know let's all try to unify under under the concept of being German somehow but um, Max is saying no let's be diverse let's be different and that that means there's conflict right that means there's going to be discussions and and struggles um, who's got the lead and who who gets to say what but it's more realistic. That's what we're living. That's what people on the streets are living. That's what that's what life in modern Germany, in modern Berlin is like right now. Um, so, yes, I haven't done it particularly personally, but um, I'm here for it. Anybody who would like to do a joint project with me in that sphere, I'm 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 in. Yeah, I can't resist like questions to the writer. Okay. He's writer only, and there's this. I know that you're a fan of of Toni Morrison. Mm -hmm. Um, and Toni Morrison said after Baldwin died, wait, I've noted it down. You know, he, um, she kind of wrote a letter uh, posthumously to Baldwin and said, "You know, didn't you how I needed your language, and the mind that formed it." And I've wanted to know um, whose minds and words. Um, that formed yours um, that you need, or who are, except for for Morrison and Achebe and others, who, who are the writers that that helped you shape yeah. them? Hmm. <clears throat> That's difficult if I have to leave Morrison out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but okay, I'll try. So <clears throat> in the UK, as a young child, I read a lot and, and I, I really enjoyed reading. Um, I really enjoyed actually stories like um, whatever Charlie and the Chocolate Factory uh, and the whole Roald Dahl thing. Uh, I really enjoyed the author called Judy Bloom, who wrote stories about young girls, um, teenagers. Um, I followed a lot of her work. Um, there's a book that I really love called uh, Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry from Mildred D. Taylor. That's one of the first books I read by a black author. I think it's the first book I read where I actually cried 
<clears throat> when I was reading it and I was fascinated by how she did it because I in my mind I was like come on this is just letters on a page why are you crying <laughs> but she managed to trigger something in me with her words um, and the story so yes I was really 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 um, influenced by her and Maya Angelou as well I was very influenced by and then I started to study <clears throat> Okay, so I went to school and I did Shakespeare, of course. Shakespeare was okay. I, you know, I wasn't a huge fan, but it was okay. He had his moments. And I liked Chaucer. <laughs> and then when I started to study um, Germanistic, German, I was really fascinated by Brecht. Brecht, and um, by now I know that Brecht probably didn't write all his own stuff. So I used Brecht as a kind of group, <laughs> group terminology. But I really liked what he did. And um, yeah, Duren Matt, Der Besuch der Alten Dame, or uh, Be the Man on the Brandstifter from Max Frisch. I was like, I'm here for it. I liked the combination of humor and political commentary. And so that was something that I wanted to do with my writing too. Yeah. You have a, a very, very, very distinct style of, of writing. It's very. Um, I think of synchronicity, for instance, it's short vignettes and a um, person loses a color every day. That's basically the structure. It's a very condensed structure and many, sometimes, a lot of times I would call it economic. And I wonder how you're going to write it or what your novel will be like. Mm. It's of course, a very different type of, and I was um, interested in the way you think about those forms and what made you pick novelistic writing now and not the short <laughs> vignettes. Yes, <laughs> it's a good question. I was kind of forced into the novel. <laughs> you know, when I, I, I wrote my first book in 2012. I was writing it in 2011. And before that, I was always writing short things, short stories, poems, a couple of songs. I'm not a singer, but you know, I tried. <laughs> and then um, I thought to myself, no, now it's time to write. I, I, I had set myself the aim to write a novel. Uh, you can do this. And I set myself a goal and I gave myself a year. And I ended up producing um, The Things I'm Thinking While Smiling Politely. Um, and it's about 100 pages long, but it's a novella. Um, and if you, anybody who knows the book will know that that's also made up of different, very, very short pieces, you know? So I always say kind of cheated. I didn't really write a novella. I just wrote lots of short stories and <laughs> pushed them all together and then put a cover on it. And like, here you go. <laughs> Um, so when I wrote the short story, Herr Grottrup set sich hin, it was intended to be a short story in the outset because I had been asked to write a text about critical whiteness, uh, what, what it means, what it does to a person when they're white in a white society, let's say. And I was actually asked to write this text as a, um, an academic text um, or an article, essay. And I asked if I could write a short story because I just felt like there had been already many, many wonderful texts already written in German. And at this point, I'd like to plug the book Mütten, Masken und Subjekte from uh, Eggers et al., which is a great book. On its, I think it's the first publication of its kind on critical, uh, kritisches Weissseins Forschung in Germany. So I said, let me write a short story. And they said, okay, which was lucky that they were flexible like that. And so I wrote this Herr Grottrup story. And when I showed it to people, they were like, oh, we need to know more. What happens next kind of thing. So that's how it, I first started to think about writing a novel based on that story. But um, the publication never happened. So the story ended up in my Dropbox. And I was working full time and had children. So um, I wasn't writing, I wasn't gonna be writing a novel anytime soon. I was, if I was writing, it was always gonna be short things. And then by some stroke of luck, I ended up being invited to participate in the um, competition, Tage der Deutschsprachigen Literatur. Again, my another reason, reason look, um, habe ich sogar uh, den ersten Preis gewonnen. And that made, everything different again. Then I was offered um, a contract 
um, well, I was taking under contract by an agent and I was offered a, a, a book contract with Fisher Verlag. And so I had this opportunity then to turn this short story into a novel. And I had an idea of what I wanted to do. I had a kind of vision for what the novel should be like. And then my plan was to write, I was gonna write it in a year or two years. You know, I was very ambitious. <laughs> it, ended, it ended up taking me four years to write this book. And it was really, really hard. I'm not, I'm, I'm not really a long form person. I, I think I managed it. I guess when you read it, we can have another conversation when you can tell me what you think. But I did manage it in the end, but it was hard. It was, it, it cost me a lot of discipline. Yeah. You have, if I'm, I, I only read the little information that I that I could find, but if I'm correct, you have exploded both any version of character and of time. Ada lives at different times in different places. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so much for not sticking to that very old concept of one heroine. It's multiple. It's yeah. All yeah. over the place. <laughs> it's, it's wild. <laughs> Bumpy ride, I would say. Yeah, we'll see what people make of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had. I, I know that our time is uh, our time is already up, and uh, I'm, I'm not even half through. But I actually wanted to to end by by reading part of a poem that I think um, I think you like by one of the German writers, my Ayim. Um, and since we talked about colors and synchronicity, and that is about colors too. Nachdem sie mich erst anschwärzten, zogen sie mich dann durch den Kakao, um mir schließlich weiß machen zu wollen, es sei vollkommen unangebracht, schwarz zu sehen. You said you don't, you're not very optimistic. Um. <laughs> yes, I said that, yeah. Which is, which is not the whole story. I'm not, I was not optimistic with regards to that specific question mm -hmm. yes. and um, the explosion. I think the explosion would be a good thing. It sounds it sounds negative, it sounds violent, but I think something that shakes up the system and gives us an opportunity to reconfigure it all would be good. But I don't think that will happen. But in general, I think I'm an optimist. In general, I I like to think um, all activists actually are optimistic because otherwise they wouldn't do <laughs> the wild things that they do. And so I think in general, I would like to think that things can improve, but I don't, I mean, I think I'm living with the system as it is right now and doing my little bit to change it. Mm -hmm. I think my children are also going to be living in the system pretty much as it is now with some cosmetic changes, but they're going to be living with it. I think substantial change will take time. I think racism is a project that's existed for centuries and it's not going to disappear in a couple of yeah years so it's it's how can we how can we transform it within like i said within our own modes of living like not trying to do something heroic but just trying to incorporate it into our daily lives as a practice yeah as a practice as, as an everyday practice start being in, practice. in your own life yeah i hate to do this but thank you so much for being here with us Thank all of you in front of your computer screens, wherever you may be, who knows. Um, but thank you, Sharon, for taking the time to talk to and with us. And um, I'm looking forward to reading about Ada. Yeah. <laughs> um, we will continue our Monday night conversations on solidarity next week with Marianne Heimbach-Steins, who will be talking about solidarity with refugees. That's a talk in German, followed by our usual Q&A. So what remains for me to do after I've way exceeded our, our time limit is to wish